Today's topic is vector potentials. So what do we mean by a vector potential? Well, what do we mean by a potential in general? An example would be, you know from your undergraduate studies, that an electrostatic field, so a non-time varying electric field, can be derived from a potential. It can be written as E, the vector field, is equal to minus the gradient of some scalar function. We'll use the Greek letter psi for this right now. And in fact, in that case, psi has the significance that it is a potential energy. It is voltage, joules per coulomb of charge. And the difference of potential between two points represents the difference in energy of a charge at those two points, meaning it's the energy that would be required to move a charge, a unit charge, from one point to the other. And then we end up with, uh, for example, in this case, we have Coulomb's law for the potential of a point charge. It falls off as 1 over R. And for then a distribution of charge, we end up with something that would look like this. The potential function, psi, as a function of position, is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, the integral over all space of the charge density at position r prime over the distance or the uh, length of the vector connecting r, that's where we're looking at the potential, and r prime, that's where we're looking at the charge dv prime. And so this would be an idea where over here you've got some charge density q and out here is your position r where you're wanting to know what the potential is. And you go through the regions in space where there is a non-zero charge density. And so that's your position r prime. And this would be that distance between r and r prime. Of course, the potential would vary as 1 over that distance, as it does. And then you just sum that up over all the charges. So that's an example of a potential. Now, when we're dealing with non-static fields, right, that would be a static field would be the case where the curl of E is equal to 0. If the curl of E is equal to 0, then because the curl of the gradient of a scalar is equal to 0, that implies that we can write E as plus or minus the gradient of a scalar. But if instead we've got the dynamic case where the curl of E is minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux density, we could no longer represent E as minus the gradient of a scalar. We need a more advanced concept. Now let's write Faraday's law for the phasor case. The curl of E is equal to minus the time derivative, but in the phasor domain, that's a factor of j omega, and then times B, and we'll write B as mu H. Well, the first thing we can do with that is we can solve this for H. I just divide by these, these terms here or multiply by j and then divide by omega mu, and you get that h is equal to j over omega mu times the curl of E. Well, the first thing that tells us is that if we know the electric field, then the magnetic field is fully specified. We only really need to solve for the electric field. The magnetic field comes along for the ride, so to speak. Again, this is why we talk about the electromagnetic field as one whole, one complete um, entity, which has these two components, E and H, as well as the flux components. That's the first thing, is that you can solve for H if you know E. Uh, the second thing is it shows you that H can be written as a constant times the curl of another vector. Well, let's do this. Let's define a vector A, so I'll put 
equal with a delta, that means by definition, is just J E over omega. All right, so I'm just defining this new vector that's just the electric field times J over omega. If I do that, then this middle equation becomes, well, here's your J over omega times E would be A. So it's just one over mu is left times the curl of A. And if I multiply through by mu, and since mu h is b, we could also say this would be uh, b is equal to the curl of A. We call A the magnetic vector potential. It's a potential because one of the field vectors can be derived from it through differential operations. It's a vector potential because it's a vector, not a scalar, and it's the magnetic vector potential because it's the magnetic field that can be derived from it through a curl operation. And so we call that the magnetic vector potential. So, well, that seems a little bit ridiculous just to define a vector that's essentially just the electric field times j over omega. What's the point? Here's the point. If h is 1 over mu curl of a, remember that the curl, this is an identity, now the curl of the gradient of a scalar function is identically equal to 0. That's an identity. And that tells us that we can add the gradient of a scalar function to this definition of a. So we can replace that by a now is defined to be, let's do it this way, j over omega e plus the gradient of some scalar function psi. And we're still guaranteed that um, h will be 1 over mu times the curl of A, because this new term, when you take the curl of it, it's equal to zero. So that means that A is proportional to the electric field plus I'm going to call this just a wiggle term. This is a wiggle term here. Psi can be any scalar function as long as it's twice differentiable, so you can do this operation of curl of gradient of psi. And I'm calling it a wiggle term because we can choose this to make our equation simpler, to cause things to cancel out. So this is a great advantage of using a potential function. Now, turning this definition around, we can solve for E as E is equal to, let's see, multiply both sides by J, it put, give it minus one here, so also multiply by minus one, so you get minus J times omega, times a, and then we'd subtract gradient of psi. So what is, so that is how we can solve for e in terms of a, and also this wiggle term. Now, if omega was equal to zero, that would be the DC case, the static field case. This term would go away, and this would just reduce to e is equal to minus the gradient of a potential function. And that, in that case, psi would be the voltage, the electrostatic potential. In the more general case, it doesn't necessarily have to have a physical significance. Um, we can choose it to be whatever we want it to be. Because, obviously, if we're free to choose A, uh, we can make, choose A to combine with minus gradient psi to make anything we want, because A is completely free.
we take that point of view. So we've defined a vector magnetic potential to be J over omega times E plus the gradient of some scalar function psi. And adding that gradient of psi does not change the curl of A. It is still true that H will be equal to 1 over mu times the curl of A. Why? Because the curl of the gradient of a scalar function is identically zero, so it doesn't change the curl of this to add that term. But now, let's think about the divergence. What is the divergence of A? Well, that's going to be J over omega times the divergence of E plus the divergence of the gradient of psi. The divergence of the gradient, that's what we call the Laplacian. Now, that term is determined by physics. You know, that's a physical quantity. We don't get to choose that. Nature determines that. But this term here is arbitrary. Now, we've said that the psi function is arbitrary. How can we be sure that the Laplacian of psi would be arbitrary? Well, in electrostatics, we've got Poisson's equation. The Laplacian of the potential as a function of position is equal to minus 1 over epsilon 0. This would be electrostatics in free space times the charge density as a function of position. So the Laplacian of psi is proportional to this arbitrary charge distribution. That, we can make Q of R be anything we want. We can imagine any distribution of charge. So that means we can create an arbitrary Laplacian throughout space. So that is truly arbitrary. And what that means is, given some uh, divergence of E, we can add this term in to make the divergence of A be anything. So the divergence of A, which would be a, a scalar function, divergence of a vector is a scalar, but this can be any scalar field function of position. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that by using this vector magnetic potential concept, the curl of A We'll say that is physical. In other words, it's fixed by the physics. 1 over mu times that has to be the magnetic field. But the divergence of A is, let's just call it free. We can make it anything we want, including 0. Right, just take this arbitrary Laplacian to be the negative of the divergence of E, whatever that is, and the divergence of A disappears. So that gives us a degree of freedom in forming our equations that is extremely useful. And it means that representing the electromagnetic field in terms of this vector magnetic potential can be more powerful analytically than solving directly for either the electric or the magnetic field. So we'll see this extensively throughout this course. So we know how to get the magnetic field from A, 1 over mu curl of A. Let's see how to get the electric field. Let's work with Ampere's law. The curl of H is equal to J plus J omega epsilon E. And let's turn around uh, that expression and solve for E. So E would be equal to, well, we're going to divide by j omega epsilon. So we have a 1 over j omega epsilon. And then we'll have the curl of h minus j. But what's the curl of h? Well, here's h. h is 1 over mu, the curl of a. So 
If we put that into this expression, that would be equal to 1 over j omega epsilon. The curl of h, which is 1 over mu times the curl of a, minus j. And if mu is a constant, it's not a function of position in space, then this curl operation, well, it's a, a constant with respect to those derivatives, so we can just factor it out. And so if we, if we have that mu is equal to a constant, then this is equal to 1 over 1 over j omega mu epsilon, the curl of the curl of a, and we factored out a 1 over mu, so we've got an add a mu for the j term there, so minus mu j, so that mu cancels that mu, so that we end up with just minus j over j omega epsilon. So this would be, well, let's put, it, put that down here. This is, this is the case mu is equal to a constant. And if it's not, then we have to use this form. And that would mean that in this curl, there would be derivatives of 1 over mu. That would be a little bit complicated. But in a simple medium, where mu is a constant, this is now the expression for the electric field. So let's just summarize this. Um, that h is 1 over mu times the curl of a. And e is 1 over j omega mu epsilon times the curl the curl of a minus mu j. And finally, um, the case we're going to be mostly interested in is the source-free regions. So if it's source-free, that would be j is equal to 0, q is equal to 0. In that case, then, we've got that h is 1 over mu curl of a, and e is 1 over j omega mu epsilon, the curl of the curl of a. And those are the expressions now for the electric and magnetic field in terms of the vector magnetic potential. And this makes it very clear explicitly that we only need to solve for one vector field, in this case the vector magnetic potential. And the other fields, the actual electric and magnetic fields, can be derived from that through these differential operations. Now, this idea of representing the electric and magnetic fields in terms of a single vector field, the vector magnetic potential, is even more powerful than we've alluded to. And here's one of the reasons. Imagine we take A to only have, say, a Z component, A hat Z times AZ. Now, that's, that means A is effectively a scalar function. It's a vector field, but it only has one scalar component. H is equal to 1 over mu, the curl of A. All right, and what is that? Let's see. Well, uh, what's the curl? Of some, it only has a Z component, so that would be, let's see, the X component would be the Y derivative of the Z component, so that would be 1 over mu, the Y derivative of the Z component, minus the Z derivative of the Y component, but there's no Y component of A. Okay? And then the y, so that would be that, times a hat x. And the y component of this would be the z derivative of ax minus the x derivative of az. So this would be minus 1 over mu x derivative of az times a hat y. So notice, there won't be any z component of the curl, because the z component of the curl would involve... Uh, x derivative of the y component and then uh, minus the y derivative of the x component. But A has no x or y components. So, in that case, we say that we have a T, M, Z field. T, M means transverse magnetic 
to the z direction. Transverse meaning it's perpendicular, orthogonal to the z direction. It has no z component. So it turns out that any magnetic field that is TMZ can be represented as 1 over mu times the curl of a vector potential that has only a z component. Moreover, if we now look at E, E is equal to 1 over j omega mu epsilon. The curl of curl of A, we're worried just now about source-free regions. What is the curl of the curl of A? We had a vector identity that we studied in the first week. The curl of the curl of A is the gradient of the divergence of A minus the Laplacian of A. But A has only a z component. So this would be 1 over j omega mu epsilon. So the divergence of A, right, that's the x derivative of the x component plus the y derivative of the y component, but those are both 0, plus the z derivative of the z component, and then the gradient of that. So that would be A hat x, the x derivative of the z derivative of A z, plus then A y hat would be the y derivative of the z derivative of A z, and then plus A z hat, that would be the z derivative of the z derivative of A z. So that would be second with respect to z, a z, and then minus the Laplacian of a. But remember, in rectangular coordinates, the Laplacian of a vector field has x component, which is the Laplacian of the x component of the vector field, and the same for the y and the z components. So this would just have, this would just be minus only a z component, Laplacian of a z. So minus the Laplacian of a z, which is what? Second derivative with respect to x, second derivative with respect to y, second derivative with respect to z. And we've got a second with respect to z minus the same thing, so those cancel. And so now we get that e is 1 over j omega mu epsilon the x component is the second with respect to x and z of a z. The y component is the second with respect to uh, y and z of a z. And the z component is now going to be minus the sum of the second derivative with respect to x and the second derivative with respect to y of az. We have now explicit expressions for the x, y, and z components of the electric field. And this means we can summarize all of this, and we'll use this quite a bit. Let's summarize. hx is 1 over mu times the y derivative of a z. h y is 1 over mu, um, sorry, minus 1 over mu, times the x derivative of a z, and h z is 0. That's why it's a TMZ field. Ex up here is 1 over j omega mu epsilon times the second derivative with respect to x and z of a z. Ey is 1 over j omega mu epsilon, second derivative with respect to y and z. A z, and then finally E z is minus 1 over j omega mu epsilon 
second derivative with respect to x of az plus second derivative with respect to y of az. And so we see that if a has only a z component, we can have an electric field that has all three components and a magnetic field with x and y components. The only constraint is that the magnetic field can have a z component. And it turns out that any solution of Maxwell's equations, that is TMZ, can be derived from a vector potential, vector magnetic potential that has only a z component. That means all TMZ problems, any problem where we know from some physical constraints that there's no Z component of the magnetic field, these five non-zero field components can all be derived from a single scalar function, AZ. That's wonderful. That means we get away from vector equations and we can deal with just a scalar equation. Very, very powerful result. The ideas we've been discussing are formalized in the Helmholtz theorem. And this tells us that if I have some arbitrary vector field, let's say a, a physically plausible vector field, in other words, not some bizarre mathematical creature that has an infinite number of discontinuities or something like that, but a reasonably smooth, um, physically plausible vector field, that can be represented as the sum of minus the gradient of a scalar plus the curl of a vector. Where A here is not necessarily the vector magnetic potential, it's just some scalar, uh, some vector field. And psi is not necessarily an electrostatic potential, it's just some, some scalar field. And the reason we know this is we can appeal to electrostatics. Um, we can write Poisson's equation. Laplacian of psi of r is equal to minus q of r. And for now, let's take epsilon 0 to be equal to 1, just for mathematical simplicity. I'm just the rescaling of the, the charge, really. So we know that this equation has a solution, which is psi of r is 1 over 4 pi, and epsilon 0 is equal to 1 here. So it's 1 over 4 pi. The integral over all space, q of r prime, dv prime, that's a little bit of charge. And it's a distance magnitude of r minus r prime away from the field point where we're measuring the psi function. And so there's a formula. So Give, give me some Q of R, and I can represent it as minus the Laplacian of another function, psi, and here's the formula for psi. Okay. So that just tells you that any scalar field can be represented as the negative of the Laplacian of a different scalar field. Now, suppose F is just some vector field arbitrary vector field. It has an x component. It has a y component. And it has a z component. Well, each of those components is a scalar field. That means it can be represented, right? This tells you the q of r can be represented as minus the Laplacian of psi of r. So I can do that for each one of these components. So let's write this as, so minus ax hat and fx will re represent as minus the Laplacian of bx. b is not necessarily the magnetic flux density, it's just some, bx is just some scalar field. And ay, well the fy will represent as minus the Laplacian of another scalar field called by and a z hat well fz will represent as minus the laplacian of bz why because any scalar field can be represented as the negative of the laplacian of some other field 
So let's call those other fields bx, by, and bz. Now, in vector notation then, that just tells us that f is minus the Laplacian of the vector field b, which has components bx, by, and bz. And we know that the curl of the curl of b is the gradient of the divergence of b minus the Laplacian of b. And therefore, since f is equal to minus the Laplacian of b, well, let's move this term over to the other side and we can solve for minus the Laplacian of b is the curl of the curl of b minus the gradient of the divergence of b. So we, that means we can represent f as minus the gradient of the divergence of b plus the curl of the curl of b. Now let's define psi to be equal to the divergence of b. All right, so that's going to be this term right here. And let's define a to be equal to the curl of b. Again, a and b are not in necessarily in any way related to the, the a and b of electromagnetic theory. They're just some vector fields. If that's true, then f can be represented as minus the gradient of divergence of b is psi plus the curl of the curl of b, but the curl of b we called a. And so there's Helmholtz, the Helmholtz theorem. Any vector field can be represented as minus the gradient of a scalar field plus the curl of a vector field. Now, what's the advantage of this? Well, we've kind of already alluded to it in our previous uh, discussions, but let's look at the divergence of f. Well, what's the divergence of the curl of a? We've shown that as a vector identity. That's equal to zero. So that just leaves minus the divergence of the gradient of psi. Well, the divergence of the gradient is the Laplacian. So that's minus Laplacian of psi. And what about the curl of f? Well, the curl of the gradient of a scalar is equal to zero, so that'll just leave the curl of curl of a. Curl of f is equal to the curl of the curl of a. And what that shows is that the, the divergence of f and the curl of f can be separately specified. One's in terms of this function psi, and the other is in terms of the curl of the curl of A. So in that sense, these are independent. So we can separately specify a curl or a divergence. And again, that's very, very useful as we'll see. So we can have a situation where only having a single z component of the vector magnetic potential can allow us to represent all three components of the electric field and two components of the magnetic field with the constraint that there is no z component of the magnetic field, the so-called TMZ modes. And indeed, the most general TMZ mode can be represented in this way. So let's remember that this came from starting with Faraday's law. The curl V is equal to minus J omega mu H and rearranging that to show that h could be represented as a constant times the curl of a vector e, and then we use that to define the vector magnetic potential, and so then we can add this gradient of an arbitrary scalar function and so on. Let's see if we can start with Ampere's law. Curl of h is equal to current density j plus j omega epsilon e, 
Well, this current density is a problem now because we can't just say that E would be proportional to the curl of another vector because it would be also we'd have to subtract the J. So let's assume we're in a source-free region. So there's no J, no current density. Then we have the curl of H is equal to J omega epsilon E, very much analogous to uh, Faraday's law. So let's solve that for the electric field. We can write that E is equal to um, let's see, multiply both sides by J. So and then you get a minus one on the left, so you have to also multiply by minus one and then divide by omega epsilon, and we'll end up with then minus one over epsilon, the curl of J H over omega. Remember, we started off defining the, the A vector as J E over omega. So in this form, this suggests that we may want to define a new vector potential. Let's call this F. It's initially going to be J J over H times omega. So just something proportional to the magnetic field. And then E would be minus 1 over epsilon times the curl of F. And F will be, we're going to call that the electric vector potential. A potential because field vectors can be derived from it by taking derivatives, and explicitly it's the electric field that can be derived that, in that way, so it's the electric vector potential. Now we can do the same trick as before. We can say, well, we can add in to H a gradient of an arbitrary scalar function. Let's call it psi sub e. And that's going to be our wiggle term. Now, unlike Faraday's law and the vector magnetic potential, which is always valid, because of this assumption of a source-free region, this idea is only valid in a source-free region. So you've got to keep that in mind, this electric vector potential. So with that, of course, that won't change the curl of F because the curl of a gradient of a scalar is always zero. So it's still true that E is equal to minus 1 over epsilon curl of F. And now we have this wiggle term that we can use to try to get rid of various terms in our equations that we're trying to solve. And then to solve for, that's, that's our expression for E. Now to get H, well, we can go up here to, um, to Faraday's law to get H. H is then 1 over J omega mu, and we put these these guys together over here, E would then be, you get the curl of the curl of F, and then a minus 1 over epsilon, there's a minus here, those minuses would cancel. We end up with this expression then for H. H is equal to 1 over J omega mu epsilon, the curl of the curl of F. So we've got this expression for E, and this expression for H. And... If we, and this is where the big payoff is, if we can get by just having a single scalar component of this F, just let's just take a Z component, well, it's almost the same steps we went through when we had only a Z component of A, except we've got, you know, the mu's and the epsilons are changed and there's some few changes of sign and, and the like. We end up with the following expressions for the electric field, EX, is minus 1 over epsilon, the y derivative of fz. ey is 1 over epsilon, the x derivative of fz. And ez is equal to 0. So this is a tez field, transverse electric to the z direction field. It has no z component. And HX, we do the same thing, curl, curl of F. We write it as gradient divergence of F minus Laplacian of F and so on. HX is 1 over J omega uh, 
view epsilon, the second derivative with respect to x and z of f x, h y is one over j omega u epsilon, the second derivative with respect to y and z of f z and h z is minus one over j omega mu epsilon, the second derivative with respect to x of f z plus the second derivative with respect to y of f z. And now we have five field components, in this case all three components of h and the x and y components of e represented by a single scalar component of the electric vector potential. Again, this is only valid in a source-free region. Now we can combine the vector magnetic potential and the, uh, the magnetic vector potential and the electric vector potential and have them both in play at the same time. That gives us even more flexibility. If we do that, then we end up with H is 1 over mu the curl of A for the magnetic vector potential plus 1 over J omega mu epsilon the curl of the curl of F and E is equal to minus 1 over epsilon the curl of f plus 1 over j omega mu epsilon the curl of the curl of a. Now, where we will make particular use of this is if we then, right, because our idea here the big payoff for us is that using these vector potentials allows us to represent almost all six components of the E and H, five components with a single potential, just with a single scalar component. So we're reducing a big nasty vector problem to a much more manageable scalar problem. If we have a z component of a and we have a z component of f then we can combine the the previous uh, expressions we had for all the e and h components and it turns out that that can represent any e and h fields any solution to maxwell's equations it can be represented now just with two scalar components one for a and one for f and that's that's as much as we can compress the math. Uh, but that's kind of interesting. It kind of tells you the actual degrees of freedom in an electromagnetic field, which, which would have two field vectors, each with three components, so that's six scalar functions, can actually be derived from two fundamental scalar functions. Okay, big, big payoff. As an aside, um, we won't make use of this, but you might see it in other textbooks or in the literature. There are are related vectors called the Hertz vectors. And for the, uh, the phasor case we're looking at, A is equal to J omega mu epsilon big pi, vector pi, and F is equal to J omega mu epsilon vector pi sub M. These are these are called the Hertz vectors, the, the pi and pi sub m. And they're in the phasor domain, they're simply just proportional to the a and the f. But you'll sometimes see those, those used as, as an alternate way to, to do this. We won't do that, but you might see that in the literature or other textbooks. So now that we've seen how to represent the electric and magnetic fields in terms of vector potentials, and possibly only needing a single scalar component of a single vector potential. What we now need to say is, well, okay, so then what equations do the vector potentials satisfy? What are the wave equations for the magnetic vector potential and the electric vector potential? <clears throat> 
So we'll start off with the magnetic vector potential. So remember that uh, we developed the idea of the vector magnetic potential starting with Faraday's law. We said, well, the curl of H can be represented, uh, I'm sorry, H can be represented as the curl uh, of E times some constants. So that's the idea that, that H can be represented as a constant times a curl of some other vector. And then we said, well, we can add in this gradient of a scalar without changing the curl and so on. So anyway, the point is that Faraday's law is already built in to our definition, the way we derive the, uh, the curl of A. So the other equation we, we may need to make sure is satisfied is Ampere's law. Curl of H is equal to J plus J omega epsilon E. Well, what, uh, what is H? H is equal to 1 over mu times the curl of A. And what is E in terms of A? Well, E is equal to minus J omega A um, minus the gradient of scalar, scalar function psi. Well, again, that's our wiggle term. So let's plug those in to uh, Ampere's law. So we'll get on the left, we'll get the curl of H is 1 over mu times the curl of A. And that's equal to J plus J omega epsilon. E is minus J omega A minus the gradient of psi. And that's our arbitrary wiggle term there. Now, this curl of this expression here, if mu is a function of position, if it's an inhomogeneous m medium, that gets pretty, pretty messy. So let's assume mu is equal to a constant. No assumption yet about epsilon, but just mu is equal to a constant. Then that's a constant. We can pull it out. In fact, we can multiply both sides by mu to clear it, this fraction over on the left. And then we end up with the curl of the curl of A is equal to mu j plus j omega mu epsilon times minus j omega a minus the gradient of psi. And now the curl curl of a, right, we have the vector identity that that's equal to the gradient of the divergence of a minus the Laplacian of a. Okay, so that's equal to mu j plus j omega mu epsilon minus j omega a minus gradient of psi. And then let's rearrange this. Uh, let's put the Laplacian of a over on the right, and then also here we'll have j times minus j is 1 omega squared mu epsilon a. And then We'll move all that over to the left. So Laplacian of A plus omega squared mu epsilon A. That looks like the Helmholtz equation. And what everything else uh, that we have will be on the right. Let's see. So the mu J goes to the other side. That makes it minus mu J. We'll have the uh, gradient of the divergence of A. And then here, let's see, uh, minus j omega mu epsilon Laplacian psi, that goes to the other side, so that becomes a plus j omega mu epsilon gradient of psi. Now, these are, well, this guy here, the, the gradient, of, of the uh, divergence of A is a, is a very messy term because it mixes up. A right? gradient is the X derivative of the A component plus the Y derivative of the Y component, et cetera, and then you've got the X derivative of that and the Y derivative of that. That mixes up all the components and all the derivatives. That's a very messy term. But notice, this is a gradient of something, and this is a gradient of something. Well, what if we could get J omega mu epsilon, the gradient of psi, to be minus the gradient of the divergence of A. Then those two terms would cancel out. And that'll be true if psi 
which is arbitrary, remember, is minus 1 over j omega mu epsilon times the divergence of a. So we just simply say, well, we can make psi be whatever we want it to be. Let's make it be this. And if it is, right, plug that in here, that guy cancels this, you get a minus the gradient of the divergence of a. And then that makes these two terms go away. Now you can say, well, we don't know what a is. Yeah, that's true. We're going to get an equation we try to solve for a, but we always require that psi be equal to minus 1 over j omega mu epsilon divergence of a, because we can set it to be equal to anything we want. Here's where the, the big trade-off comes. Now we get rid of those last two terms. And defining beta squared to be equal to mu squared, uh, uh, omega squared mu epsilon, sorry, we end up with this equation. The Laplacian of a plus beta squared a is equal to minus mu j. That's a much nicer equation than this. And moreover, remember the uh, wave equation we derived for the electric field? It was the Laplacian of E plus beta squared E is equal to J omega mu J, pretty similar so far, but then there was a plus the gradient of the divergence of E. And that is a nasty term. Mixes up all the components of E and all the derivatives. We don't want that. This doesn't have that kind of a term. We got rid of it because of having this fiddle term, wiggle room, this wiggle term. Uh, and see, the beautiful thing about this equation is this breaks up into three scalar equations. The x component is Laplacian of ax plus beta squared ax is equal to minus mu jx. And the same thing for y and z. You get three independent, uh, not completely independent, but three separate scalar equations, one in the x component, one in the y component, one in the z component. That's extremely important. Another thing that tells you, by the way, is, for example, if there is only an x component of the, of the uh, uh, current density, then there's only an x component of the vector magnetic potential. So if this is very powerful, like in antenna problems, where you have a wire antenna, say, that's oriented along the z direction. Well, there's only z currents then, because that's the, the wires in the z direction. Those are, that's the only direction the currents can flow. So you know you only have a z component of the vector magnetic potential. And immediately then, you know that you have a TMZ mode. There no, there's no z component of the magnetic field. And you can solve for all the other field components in terms of just, say, az. Okay. Very, very powerful. If you're in a source-free region, then you get the regular old Helmholtz equation. Laplacian of a plus beta squared a is equal to zero. And by the same kind of steps we followed, you can do the same thing for the f vector, which of course is only valid in a source-free region, and you get the Helmholtz equation. So it's kind of interesting. Remember, in a source-free region, E and H satisfy the Helmholtz equation. So we have that the electric and magnetic fields and the electric vector potential and the magnetic vector potential all satisfy, in a source-free region, the Helmholtz equation. So we have an inhomogeneous Helmholtz equation for the vector magnetic potential with a forcing function, which is minus mu j. j is the current density. And if j has only a z component, well, then a would have only a z component. So let's consider this scalar version. Minus mu j z. And now let's assume that j z is an impulse. Jz uh, is, say, J0 times delta of R. So it's an, a point current right at the origin with magnitude J0. Uh, 
And so this is equal to minus mu j0 delta of r. So let's consider this equation first when beta is equal to zero. Remember beta, beta squared is omega squared mu epsilon. So beta is equal to omega square root mu epsilon. And let's say that goes to zero. The frequency goes to zero. So we're, we're in a static case. What happens here? Well, this beta squared term goes away and we get an equation that looks like this. Laplacian AZ is equal to minus mu j0 delta of r. That looks like it, it is Poisson's equation for a point charge at the origin. And we know what the solution for that is. It's just what's the potential of a point charge at, at the origin. It's a 1 over r drop off. So the solution here is going to be, putting in the constants, az is equal to mu over 4 pi. If this mu was a 1 over epsilon, this would be a 1 over 4 pi epsilon, but it's got a mu up top instead. j0, the amplitude, and then a point charge has a potential 1 over r. If beta is not equal to 0, so the, your non-zero frequency, um, with some work that we show in more detail in the PDF notes, you can show that the solution is the same with the addition of a phase factor, e to the minus j beta r over r. So with that, now what we can say is that this is the solution to Laplacian of AZ plus beta squared AZ is equal to minus mu J0 delta of R. And this is the impulse response. Here's an impulse over on the right. And then the solution to that is the impulse response. And now if we have an arbitrary current density, Jz of R, and we'll write it as in this weird way, which we do the same thing in our linear systems theory, write it as a sampled version of itself in terms of a delta function. Integrate over all space the current density times this delta function, which just takes out a sample. But the reason we do that is this shows an arbitrary uh, distribution of current as a superposition of delta functions. So we know what the solution is for a delta function. And therefore, we know that the solution in this case will just be to apply this exact same idea, replace the delta function um, by our solution for it, the delta function, and we get this result. Az of r is equal to, we got a mu over 4 pi, the integral over all regions of space that has a non-zero current density, jz of r prime, and the delta function gets replaced by this solution, by the impulse, gets replaced by the impulse response, e to the minus j beta magnitude of r minus r prime over magnitude r minus r prime dv prime. And you can do the same thing for the x and y components. And what you end up with then, finally, is the vector equation az, uh, I'm sorry, vector magnetic potential as a function of position r is equal to mu over 4 pi, the integral over all space where there's current density, j of r prime, e to the minus j beta magnitude of r minus r prime over magnitude of r minus r prime. So this is an extremely important result times dv prime. This is a direct formula that says if you tell me what the current density is, I can tell you what the vector magnetic potential is, and then we know from that we can derive the electric and magnetic fields.
So we won't use this a lot in this course, but this is tremendously useful in antenna theory. Remember, you drive some certain currents on an antenna wire, and then you can figure out what the fields are that are created by that. And as we said before, a very nice aspect of this is, for example, if you know that your current density has only a Z component, then you know that your vector magnetic potential has only a Z component, and you, therefore you have a TMZ field. And so it encapsulates a lot of important physical information and gives us a, a, a really a practical solution to a very wide class of problems where we know a current density and we, from those we can calculate the electric and magnetic fields.